Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Houston United Methodist Church. We're glad that you joined us today, and we eagerly look forward to worshiping God together, united as one body. In preparation for the service today, I, I want to make you aware of some resources we have that will assist you in getting the most out of today's worship service. The first thing I want to tell you about is that we have a service bulletin and sermon fill-in available to you at HoustonUMC.com. And if you received an email with a link to this service, it was also there as an attachment. If you go to the website, just look for the big red button that says e-bulletin. Please feel free to view or print this document out as it will help guide you through the service. And you may also find that a pen and a Bible will be useful to you as we journey together today. In order for us to best serve you, we have developed an online communication card. You can find a link to this again at HoustonUMC.com. Just look for the big red button that says communication card. Or if you received an email with a link to this service, it was also linked in that email. This form will allow you to let us know you were here and give you an opportunity to share prayer requests with us or to request a visit with our pastor or even send us a message via the comment option. Number three, we'll be taking communion today, so if you need to pause now and grab the necessary supplies for that, we encourage you to do so. And finally, we want to offer you a word of encouragement. Interact with this service. Sing along with the music. Recite the Lord's Prayer. Say the communion liturgy as it appears on the screen. And shout amen during the sermon if it speaks to you and the Spirit begins to move in your life. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 107, verses 23 through 25, which state, some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. Join me in prayer this morning. O Lord our God. You are always more ready to bestow your gifts on us than we are to seek them. And are willing to give more than we desire or deserve. Help us so to seek that we may truly find. So to ask that we may joyly receive. So to knock that the door of your mercy may be opened to us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
Today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 16 to 21. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Thanks be to God for the blessing of his word. I have spent most of my life trying to avoid storms, both figurative and literal. For example, I, I had a great childhood. Both my parents loved me. I played sports, and when I applied myself, I was a good student. I was part of a great church youth group, and I developed friendships that I still have to this day. However, my family life was a little bit crazy. My parents were divorced and carried different value systems. Therefore, the messaging I got from them about values, religion, relationships, and behavior was at times vastly different. There was also the issue of splitting time between their separate families, which led to a new level of confusion. If you've ever seen the movie Talladega Nights with Will Ferrell, you probably remember his two boys respond to their parents' divorce announcement with a proclamation of, Yay! Two Christmases! And as someone who experienced that reality, two separate Christmases, I stand before you today and say that my response was anything but yay. My family situation was a little bit of a storm in a sense, and it, it could be a very chaotic thing. Between the mixed messages and the running around trying to make both my parents happy, my brain felt jumbled. And so when I grew up and had the opportunity to attend college out of state in Kansas, I jumped at the chance to blaze my own trail out of that particular storm. The only problem was I was going to Kansas, and if you've ever seen the movie Wizard of Oz or the movie Twister, then you know that Kansas provides a whole other set of storms to avoid. They call them tornadoes, and it usually is a pretty good idea to stay away from them. I do everything I can to avoid storms in life, and my guess is that you probably do so as well, and I suspect that your reasons for avoiding storms are, are probably similar to mine. We don't really like the chaos that storms bring to our life, whether it's the chaos from a literal storm like a tsunami, a tornado, a hurricane, a blizzard, a flood, a, a sandstorm or the confusion caused by one of the many figurative relational storms we experience in our lives, most of us are hardwired to avoid it. We prevent chaos in our romantic life by seeking a partner that is compatible with our values and goals in life. We sidestep problems at work by finding a job we like in an organization that is consistent with our core values. We dodge storms in our friendships by surrounding ourselves with friends who think and act like we do. And we even provide stability to our lives by only following news and media from sources we know that we already agree with. On the surface, this creation that we have seems like a great plan. If we can control the situations, then we can ultimately control the outcome. There's only one problem with that scenario. Any one of us who's lived a little bit knows that you can't control everything. No matter what we do, there will be storms or there will be events in our life that cause chaos. After all, healthy people still get cancer. 
People who try their best in marriage still get divorced. The best parents still have falling outs with their children. And great employees find themselves working for companies that seemed great on the surface, only to find out later it was a difficult place to work. People who try to find people who think as they do eventually find themselves lonely because no one thinks 100% alike. So what do we do then? What do we do when despite our best efforts to avoid the storm, we find ourselves in the middle of one? You know, people throughout history have felt much the same way that we do about the storms of life. They also are not fans by the chaos that these things cause. But in the story surrounding Jesus, a carpenter turned religious teacher who lived in ancient Israel, we see storms take on a little bit of a new meaning. They were situations filled with turmoil that eventually became situations of hope. In Jesus' story, both figurative and literal storms become a tool that God used to reveal an essential truth to the world. God is always present, even in the chaos of a storm. And he's even ready to see us out of it. Here's an example. Today, our text finds Jesus' disciples waiting for him to return from a much-needed time of prayer and solitude. Jesus has just worked a miracle, feeding 5,000 men plus women and children with two small fish and five loaves of barley bread. The disciples do not know when he will return, and some accounts even say that Jesus told them to leave him alone and that he would find his own way home. All they know is that they have a treacherous six-mile passage across the Sea of Galilee to return to their home in Capernaum. It's getting dark, and they know that a storm could hit at any time. So they make the executive decision to begin their trek home. And the 12 men jump into a small boat, likely powered by four men who pulled the short straws and thus had to man the oars to move it towards home. And sure enough, when they're about three miles into their six-mile trip, a storm hits, and they find themselves afraid, unsure if they will make it home. Add to that that the disciple charged with watching for obstacles and hazards in the water claims that he sees a ghost walking on top of the sea. And we have a situation that is now filled with more chaos than any of us could probably handle. Powered by fear, the men on the oars keep rowing, unsure if the boat is even making any forward motion. But the ghost is only getting closer. Eventually, the ghost gets close enough for them to hear. And they realize that they know his voice. Again, they listen to its calls, and this time... They hear the complete statement the figure is making. It is, I am. Do not be afraid. The message and the voice now clarify that the ghost is none other than their friend and teacher, Jesus. And with joy, they welcome him into the boat, and he takes them immediately to the shore. You know, boat trips carry a certain amount of risk, even now, but especially back then. The disciples did not have a motor to power their vessel. They had to rely on the wind and brute strength. And if the wind was in your favor, that was a great option. But good luck getting anywhere if you were traveling into it. This case seems to communicate that the wind was not necessarily in the disciples' favor and that one of the storms that were frequent on the Sea of Galilee quickly developed and overtook them. And these experienced mariners, men who made a living on this body of water, were scared for their lives. 
I imagine Peter was wondering if he would ever see his wife and children again. James and John were wondering if they would ever mend nets with their father again. Matthew was questioning why he left his tax booth's comfort to die while serving as a disciple to an itinerant religious teacher. I suspect that for them, this experience was not just a story, but it was a storm. It was an authentic experience of fear and chaos. And then, when it seems all hope is lost, Jesus meets them in the middle of this experience with two words. I am. He changes the story and the trajectory of their lives. Jesus' presence changes the story from one of fear to one of joy. Sure, the disciples are happy because they find comfort in Jesus' presence. And instead of ending up at the bottom of the sea, the disciples found themselves transported to shore. But there's also a deeper meaning here. A deeper message is being conveyed. Part of what John is doing in this section of his gospel is he is connecting Jesus with the ministry of the Old Testament. And the themes that reveal his true identity Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the one God has chosen to restore Israel and the rest of humanity. In Exodus, a man named Moses has an encounter with God, and God tells him that his name is I Am. And this is the very same proclamation Jesus makes when he meets the disciples. The Psalms make it clear that God rules over the seas of the earth. And here Jesus is walking on them. Sure, it's a happy ending because he saved those men from death that day. But it's also a reminder that God protects his people from storms. And even more than that, in this story, John shows us that God is present among his people during the storms. Folks, every one of you will face some kind of storm in this life. Some of those storms will be big and others will be small. Unfortunately, chances are that some of you are going to hear the words, it's cancer from your doctor. Or worse, you're going to hear the words, we aren't really sure what it is from your doctor. Others of you viewing this morning might have vowed to love a person for the rest of your life. But that person is no longer willing to hold up the vows that they made to love you. Then there are those of you who will look at your child as they struggle to adapt to the hybrid learning model that the pandemic has forced many of our schools to adopt. And finally, some of you may even have to answer hard questions about life and death as you tell your kids that the family pet needs to make one last trip to the vet. Whatever storm you need to seem to find yourself in, big or small, you can know that God is there with you. He's with you in the middle of it, and he's going to lead you to the end of it. The question is, are you looking for him? Or like the disciples, are you so overcome with emotion that you forget that God is with you? Looking for God in the middle of life's challenges might seem like a daunting task especially if you're trying to make some sort of major and sudden change to your life. The process of faith and trusting in God to be present and to guide you safely through the storms of life is not really something that can be made in a single moment. It's not where you can suddenly decide to make a 180-degree turn in your life. 
In reality, it's a series of small steps you take so that over time, when the big storms come, you are prepared to weather them because you know that God, the I am, the one who walks on water, the one who parts the Red Sea, is with you. For many of you, this journey is going to start with a question like this. Where in the storms and the chaos of life this week do I need to look for God? And then as he reveals himself to you and answers your questions, you begin to pray and you let him know what you're feeling. You show him areas of your life where you need him to influence you and give you the faith to place your trust in his presence and his ability to guide you through those challenges. Friends, we live in a community full of people who are asking themselves that question, who are trying to navigate life's storms. And in the middle of all that chaos, we need to be asking ourselves, how can we show these people a path to peace? What would our world look like if instead of being crippled by fear and anxiety and chaos, we were empowered to navigate that chaos with the tools of faith and peace? I ask this because this is exactly what God wants to do for our world. He wants to cast out the darkness. He wants to remove the things that are keeping people in our world from him. And he's tasked us with assisting him in that mission. How can we show people that the darkest, most loneliest moments of their life? I am. God is present. And how can we show them that he cares enough to guide them through whatever they may be facing. Because if we can do that, then like the disciples, we too may witness a miracle. Only this time it won't be the miracle of surviving a storm. It'll be the miracle of seeing people released from their burdens and the brokenness that they carry with them through this life. It will be seeing God establish his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my own
Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that proves his great love towards us. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth, you formed us into your image and you breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights, you bore up the ark on the waters, saved Noah and his family, and made covenant with every living creature on earth. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for forty days and forty nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenants, your prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And on your holy mountain, he heard your still small voice. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us from our sin, your spirit led him into the wilderness, where he fasted forty days. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ. With the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. It is the Lord be with you.
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You bought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth, you formed us into your image and breathed into us the bread of life. When we turned away, our love failed. Your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights, you bore up the ark on the water, saved Noah and his family, and made covenant with every living creature on earth. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for forty days and forty nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenant, your prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And on your holy mountain, he heard your still, small voice. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us from our sin, your spirit led him into the wilderness where he fasted 40 days and forty nights to prepare for his ministry. And when he suffered and died on the cross for our sin, you raised him to life and presented him alive to the apostles during forty days, and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us new covenant by water and spirit. Now, when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance from sin and the cleansing of our hearts, that during these 40 days of Lent we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Christ. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, 
with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of of Christ. Friends, this is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ given for you. Take it and eat. Take it and drink. Go forth in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.